Hello, I'm Deborah Sims. I'm a CLL patient advocate from Melbourne, Australia, here for, at ASH for Leukemia Care UK. Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman. I'm a CLL patient myself, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the CLL Society, so I work as an advocate and educator and researcher in CLL. Published some uh, uh, abstracts and a poster here at ASH. Yes, congratulations on that. Now, we have been in quite a lot of the sessions together. It's been a very CLL-heavy meeting. Um, and Saturday, I mean, just the papers that have been published, what's been the most exciting thing for you? Well, some people have teasingly said this should be called CLL 2018. I think that's a little overstatement. But I think that it certainly gives you pause to say that maybe we need to change the way that we're treating CLL. Because we've seen over the last several years all kinds of new targeted therapies. But until this paper, we hadn't seen, until uh, this ASH meeting, we had not seen these new targeted therapies compared to the gold standards, the best in class other options that were there. And these weren't small studies, these were large studies. So let me talk about two of them that I think are critical. And they were both done in large cooperative kinds of ways, and they were both done to complement each other. And one compared FCR, and that just came out this morning in a late breaking abstract. And what was amazing about that is they broke the glass and looked at the data early, and the data was so shatteringly good, they said it's unethical not to publish this data. We need to get this out ASAP. And what that data showed was that using FCR, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, which has been the gold standard on younger patients, in this study it was under 70, uh, versus ibrutinib and rituximab. Ibrutinib is a new medication. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody. Both of these are not chemotherapy in sort of the classic sense. And the response rates were better with ibrutinib, rituximab. The, the progression-free survival, fewer people progressed. Statistically significant differences. And surprisingly, even after a short follow-up, there was an overall survival advantage. And this came with less adverse events and less side effects, less problems for the patients. So it really throws into question, what is the role of chemoimmunotherapy in this population? So let's look at the older population. And there they used what's traditionally in the recommended kind of chemoimmunotherapy, mendemustin and rituximab. So no straw dogs that they're comparing to. What the standard out in the community where you can get the best possible care is. And again, this was a study of ibrutinib, three arms, ibrutinib, ibrutinib rituximab, and bendamustin and rituximab. Uh, one interesting thing I'll say is the ibrutinib and the ibrutinib rituximab data kind of, you couldn't separate them out. They were almost identical. Both of them were vastly superior in terms of the progression of survival, the response rates compared to uh, bendamustin and rituximab. So again, it's saying this is our best chemoimmunotherapy for the older population it's not as good as an ibrutinib-based therapy. For our younger population, it's not as good as the, uh, uh, the chemotherapy is not as good as an ibrutinib-based therapy. So it really says, you know, are we putting the nails in the coffin of chemoimmunotherapy? So much hope for newly diagnosed patients. Um, they may never have to have chemotherapy, depending on where they live in the world and how quickly these drugs are made available to them. And let me just add one other thing. I'd Dr. Bird updated his data, and now we're over seven years out, and more than 80% of those patients are doing great on ibrutinib, seven years out. Yeah. yeah. What, who would have thought? I mean, how long were you on ibrutinib for? So I got about six and a half years, and that was with 17p deletion, notch Every one, patient. complex karyotype, mm -hmm. failed bone marrow transplant. I mean, about as bad as you can get, and I got six and a half years out of it, yeah. yeah. I also was um, intrigued by the, um, the the new trials going on for Richter's syndrome. I mean, right. that that's uh, the U2, and I can't. You'll right. be able to name yeah. the drugs: the right. ubliximatib or whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. ubliximab and um, umbrelisib, yes, yeah. right, and Pemblo, and yeah. So yeah, so Richter's transformation is still a significant unmet need in CLL, and this is where CLL turns bad and turns into a more aggressive, usually diffuse B cell lymphoma. So. We haven't had good treatments for this. The only thing that tends to help people is uh, 
allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is a very high risk procedure, and even then. And you have to get the patient there. Like yeah, you have to get go to the, the disease at a low enough state. So people are looking at combinations, and one of the agents that they're looking at now is what are called checkpoint inhibitors, which mm -hmm. take the brakes off the immune system. These have been used in CLL, but not with much success. They've been helpful in Hodgkin's and other mm -hmm. diseases, but not in CLL. But it turns out when they're combined with a kinase inhibitor and a monoclonal antibody, they, got, they were able to report on four patients. Two of them got very strong and durable responses. I wish it was four to four, mm -hmm. but two of them did. And this is very encouraging and suggests that maybe we can pick it up. And they're trying to tweak the, uh, tweak the uh, combination, the cocktail that they're using, maybe use some, a stronger checkpoint inhibitor, more specific. And this uh, was without our chop. I mean, that's right. what I was intrigued. They, right. they, they didn't use our chop with it. This is, again, a non-chemo approach, uh, which is, it's, so it's very exciting the direction things are going in in the CLL world. Mm. Now you talked. You mentioned unmet needs there. One unmet need that Jennifer Brown referred to was people when they are relapsing on the novel therapy. So they fail chemo, or chemo's failed them. Mm. Um, you know, they they've gone on to a BTK inhibitor, whichever one. They've relapsed on that. They then go on to a BCL2, on to venetoclax. If they start relapsing on that, these patients are in a lot of trouble. Um, what, you know, what? I mean, we're talking CAR-T at this stage, really, aren't we? I mean, that's, that's what's... So there's, there's still a couple options that are out there before CAR-T. Mm -hmm. So if you failed one kind of B-cell um, receptor inhibitor, like a BTK inhibitor, which would be in most cases, there's still a significant percentage of patients that will respond to a PI3 kinase inhibitor, mm -hmm. which blocks that same pathway, but in an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. And we find that, you know, well more than... Well, more than half of patients will respond to idelalisib or duvalisib, mm -hmm. or there's clinical trials looking at this and looking at combinations of uh, drugs in this setting. This is also a place for new clinical trials. But of course, the real sexy, exciting stuff is the CAR T's, and that's where I went when I relapsed on my BCL receptor inhibitor. And the CAR T therapies, again, very early, very small data. I wish there was 20 year follow up but it's looking like a significant percentage of these patients, and these are the kind of the worst of the worst patients, these kind of what I call double refractory, this huge unmet need. You failed, a, as you pointed out, a B-cell receptor mm -hmm. inhibitor, and you failed a BCL2 inhibitor. These patients didn't have a lot of options. Although I, I was interviewing Dr. Saar Gill before yeah. from the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They performed CAR-T on patients that had only had ibrutinib. Right. They hadn't had any. I was really surprised by that. So, as you know, all drugs begin with the worst of the worst, and then as we begin to understand their adverse events and we can tolerate them better, they get moved closer and closer. Some people talk about, could we move in CAR-T up the line? Could CAR-T be a potentially curative pay therapy? Because one of the concerns is in CLL, if your T cells have been beaten up, we can't harvest them, we can't get them to do the work. But the data on CAR-T is very encouraging, again, short, but we're getting response rates that are reported here and in other places in the 70, 80 percent in CLL, which, and this is most difficult uh, to treat uh, population. And a lot of these responses, if you get them deep enough, seem to be very durable. We, again, we don't have 20-year data, but we have like two-year data, and we have individual, like a handful of cases of patients that are now seven years out post-CAR-T that have no evidence of CLL. And it is that depth of response that has been a very big thing at this meeting, this undetectable MRD. And the fact that we're talking undetectable MRD rather than MRD negativity, it's, it's much more patient focused, I think, the language at this meeting. Um, what are the benefits of this now being the end goal for treatment? Because they, doctors weren't, I remember IWCLL in New York, remember when they, we had a room full of doctors, everyone had to say, you know, press a number on, the, on their handheld devices to say what their end goal for treatment was. And it was something like only 20% were going for no disease. This is now all about eradication of disease, isn't it? Right, so I'd throw one caveat at that. And when I talked about those great numbers for ibrutinib, very few of those patients are MRD negative, if any. So I'm happy if you control my disease. If you control my blood pressure and I have to take a pill every day, I'm fine with that. You know, reduce my risk of a heart attack and stroke, I'm fine. You don't have to wipe out my blood pressure. So I think that there is a group of patients. But obviously the holy grail is, can we stop therapy? So here's what we need to be able to do. We need to have a fixed duration therapy 
and it would be nice if that was non-chemo. There isn't a single drug that's going to get us there, mm -hmm. so we're looking at, at combinations. And I would say that this ash was all about different combinations. Ibrutinib and rituximab, ibrutinib and venetoclax, venetoclax and rituximab, venetoclax and obinutuzumab, all these different combinations and novel agents uh, that are being used in combinations. So I think that this is where we're going, and the advantage to that fixed duration is that the cancer doesn't learn to become resistant to the cells. How do we make that decision? So there's two ways to do this, and this is still the debate that's going on. We say, you get 18 months and we stop, or you get two years and we stop. But I think the more sophisticated way to stay is, we're gonna wait until you reach this point where we can't find any cancer. Doesn't mean that there's no cancer there, but to the best that we can do, down to one in 10,000 cells, there's even technology that may be able to go down to one in a million cells, we can't find a trace of your cancer. So why are we treating you? Let's stop. And, and <laughs> talking about stopping, I'm just saying they're packing up right. around us as we right. go. Yeah, these are the closing <laughs> we are. seconds, yes. And, and we're the last one standing. I, I think right. that needs to be noted, Brian. And also, just want to congratulate you for your award as a CLL he hero by Cure yeah. Magazine. I was Thank there that night. Thank you for being there. It Thank was, you for um, being there. It was a wonderful moment. You truly yeah. deserve that. Congratulations on everything you're doing for CLL Society. I could not be happier that you have responded so well to CAR-T. I hope we're going to see you in that 20-year cohort where you've been undetectable for the whole time and um, you deserve it. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I look forward to doing more and working more together and advocating together for CLL patients. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks.